a breed standard for the Dachshund. And um, you'll see through my presentation that I like to, when, I, when I'm studying a breed standard, I find the unfortunate thing about most breed standards is words. And sometimes it's difficult to understand words if you don't have the living examples before you to understand things. So when I'm studying things, I like to have a picture in my mind. And that helps me to interpret the breed standard better. So I have got examples of pictures here throughout the breed standard to help to explain. Now, as you know, the Dachshund um, is the most important breed in FCI. And I say that because we're the only one that have our own group. So pay good attention. That's my little joke. German <laughs> yeah, German mafia. But uh, let's not say that. So okay, the Dachshund. It's a German hunting dog. It's traditionally actually the actual name is Tekel, and it's a badger dog. So that's oops, sorry, wrong one. Okay, so that's a Dachshund at work with a badger. Same here again. Now. This breed is an, actually a very easy breed to understand. If you understand the function, if you understand why it was bred, the reasons why every part of the Dachshund was important to its work, you will then get this breed very easily. When you have that at the back of your mind, what it was bred to do, then you will understand every part of the Dachshund, why it was bred in such a way. So it, it's a very straightforward breed. And I always tell people, once you understand it, it's easy to judge because it's a very straightforward breed. There's nothing complicated. There's no peculiar things about it. It all goes back, ties back to function. Although most of the Dachshunds today, the ones I read and all that, are not worked, but we have to bear that in mind that it was a working dog and it was, it was bred for that specific purpose. Now, history of the breed, I'm just gonna let you read that. But what I wanna point out to you is, and I put this picture, this is what a badger looks like. It is not a soft, fluffy, uh, nice animal. Now you look at their teeth, okay? And they're similar size, look at that again. That's mean. So the reason why the dog has to have certain functions again, and I'll explain this as I go through, was because of the work it was bred to do. There are today nine sizes in the FCI, and three, sorry, three sizes and three coat varieties, giving us nine different uh, varieties of breeds. And the original one that was bred was actually the standard smooth. That was what they started with uh, for working and the, and, and the other varieties came along when they bred to spaniels to get the long coat, to the terriers to get the wire, but the original is actually the smooth. And again, for working function. So everything goes back, ties back to why the breed was developed by the Germans. So if you look at how mean a badger is, you understand why a Dachshund has to have specific features and also to understand how it, it works. Okay, I'm just gonna read this part. To be able to work successfully and efficiently, this breed needed to have intelligence, strength, endurance, and versatility. It is not a toy dog. It is not a little pet dog. It might be small in size, but the work it had to do was actually required it to have features and make it space. I always say it's a large dog with little legs. And that's the courage that they also have. That's the attitude that they have. It needed to have a moderately long body with relatively short legs and different coat types. This helped the Dachshund to work in different, difficult terrain, ranging from dense undergrowth to water. Now, this is a Dachshund in the tunnel. It goes underground. Dachshunds work underground to go to get the badgers out so that the, the hunters could then actually get them. So that's why the function of the dog. It runs over ground, but it also works below ground. Now they work with wild boars, there's uh, deer, uh, fox, but badgers is what they were initially bred to do. So it's a very functional dog. Okay, I've mentioned three varieties and three sizes. So that's standard smooth, or a smooth, a wire, and a long hair. And the uh, sizes are there, which I've already mentioned. Okay, general appearance. Now, the words in black are from the FCI standard. The words in blue are from the English standard and the Australian standard, and some from the American standard, because I, I feel that some of these words help to understand the breed better. So that's why I put them in blue, um, but we're an FCI country, so, be, you know, so we 
follow the FCI standard. So, low, short leg, elongated, compact build. And most people get a, an issue with this. How can you have compact in a long dog? The compactness is not in the length of body, but the overall build of the dog. It's compact. So it's a strong dog. Cheeky, challenging, head carriage. Now the English standard, which I love, says bold, arrogant, head carriage. When a Daxton stood, it is an arrogant dog. It looks through you. Some would say like an African. So it must have that bold arrogance to it because of the function. It is not, uh, as I said, a toy dog. A left facial expression, the English standard says intelligent expression. His general appearance is typical of his sex. Dogs and bitches, you can tell without having to look for testicles or anything like that. And in spite of his short legs, being, legs being short in relation to the long body, he's very mobile and light. So it is a very mobile dog. Okay, just giving you some examples to fix in your mind's eye with the three different coats of what was described earlier, just to fix in your, in your head. Okay, proportions is something that um, people struggle with in Dachshunds. Uh, for me, unfortunately, or fortunately, being a breeder, it's easier for me to understand proportions. But for, say, judges when they start, it's very difficult to understand how short is short, how long is long. Um, and I will explain to you on the next page. So the distance to the ground level, about one third of the height and width. Okay, this one is not exactly one third, but I'll show you the next diagram. And the body length to be in harmonious relation to height and withers, about 1 to 1.7 to 1.8. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions as I go through. Okay, so this is, this is something that's more, so you've got two thirds and one third. All right, and I'm gonna to explain to you why these proportions are important, why the Dachshund has to have ground clearance, and why it has to have, now, the, as I said to you, it's a, it's a functional dog. So, the reason why it must have ground clearance is because when it goes underground, it digs with the front feet, it pushes that earth, you're in a tunnel, it's in a tight tunnel, imagine this. It has to dig its way through, it has to push that earth through its front to the back, and the back legs then clear it out. So that's why when you look at the feet, of a Daxon. The front feet are your digging feet. So they are bigger, they are sort of think of a spade. So it's, it's a wider foot compared to the rear, which is a smaller foot because it's clearing earth. So function again. Why must a Daxon have ground clearance? You imagine, and this is an issue with English Daxons, they tend to be, Claudio agreed with me, they tend to be on the ground. The chest is virtually touching the ground. American dogs are the same. Now this is wrong because if you go back to function, if a dog has his chest on the ground, when it's digging, where is the earth going to go? There's no space to pass through. So that's why you must have clearance, ground clearance. goes back to function. So that's important. And, and, and the standard mentions specifically about having ground clearance. It is important. It's an important feature of the dog. So um, I'm not going to go through the diagram. I know the Italians will be happy that I need some mathematics in it, but um, it's just to, to give you an idea. Actually, this is Italian, if I'm not mistaken. OK, behavior and temperament. Friendly by nature, neither nervous nor aggressive, with an even temperament. This is very important. A Dexon, um, over the weekend I watched Claudio judge, and he actually disqualified a dog that tried to bite him. Now, Dachshunds are generally not friendly by nature, especially to standards, but they should not have bad temperaments because they were bred to work. So they cannot be biting people. So when you're judging Dachshunds, I personally, from a breeder's point of view as well, temperament is paramount. If the dog has a bad temperament, then it's no point dealing with it. They must be able to, especially at a show, accept a stranger going over them, touching them, without trying to bite the judge. Um, in Europe, when you measure the dogs, can you imagine if a dog cannot be handled, how do they measure the dog, the width of the chest? So temperament is very important. Do not forgive poor temperament. They are not supposed to be... It, Texans are, are standoffish dogs, especially the, the, the smooths. They do not accept strangers, strangers readily. So if you came to my house, they would bark at you, like they were going to eat you. But as soon as you come in and we're there, they don't attack you. 
So they, they, they are family dogs. I've grown up with them since I was a kid. They weren't show dogs, but we had them as pets. And they're very protective of their family. Um, the, the longs tend to be a little friendlier, and the wires, again, temperament slightly different. But generally, please do not forgive, if you're judging, do not forgive poor temperaments. Because poor temperament just goes on. Um, this is an issue with English dogs. They have kept allowing and saying that, you know, it's supposed to be um, using words in the breed standard to justify poor temperament. And that's just not acceptable. Um, passionate, persevering, fast hunting, dog with an excellent nose. It is a scent hound. So they use their nose. This part's from the English standard. Intelligent, lively, courageous to the point of rashness. I love this. Point of rashness, the Dachshund is very rash. They are not, they're, they're bold, they're courageous. So they're rash. And, uh, and they're also obedient. Especially suited to going to ground because of low build, very strong forequarters and forelegs, long, strong jaw, immense power of bite and hold. Essential to functional build is retained, is retained to ensure workability. You saw what a badger looks like. Now, if a Dachshund, uh, and I'll, I'll go into the head, I'll explain. If they have a poor under jaw, or they have poor, uh, uh, not a strong muzzle, can you imagine that trying to have a fight with a badger? It will be killed instantly. And these dogs are very precious dogs to the, to the, you know, the hunters. So they cannot afford to lose their dog in a fight to a badger. So that's why it goes back to function again. And if you look in this diagram, these ones, again, any form of excessiveness, this is, the, this is how cramped it can get. And then you've got the next bit, where the dog is a bit more exaggerated. And you've got this, look at the exaggeration. The dog cannot work. It cannot go through a tunnel. So every tunnel is not nice and wide. Like, you know, when they do, they do uh, field trials with Dexans, they build, it's purpose built. But in, in reality, you cannot. So that's why any excessiveness of any kind, too much leg, too much angulation, the dog cannot work. And as I said, courageous. They're not scared of anything. They're a, a big dog. Okay, the head. Elongated as seen from above in profile. British standard, conical. I use the word conical. Maybe I've grown up with it. It's a conical shaped head. Tapering uniformly towards the nose. Leather, yet not pointed. Superciliary ridges, clearly I define, nasal cartilage and bridge of nose long and narrow. Okay. Skull, rather flat, gradually merging with a slightly arched nasal bridge. And the stop is only indicated. It is not it's not a dead stop. It should not have it should be a very gentle stop. Now the English language says skull neither too broad nor too narrow, sloping gradually without prominent stop into slightly arched muzzle. Length from the tip of nose to eyes equal in length from eyes to occiput. That's just to give you some proportions to understand. That is 50-50, basically. Okay, and this is just examples of it. Okay, can you see what we mean by conical? This is conical. So when you look, when you, when you judge a Dachshund, the first thing you do is once you, when you approach the dog, I tend to look over the top of the head of the dog and I put my fingers by the side to see how much daylight goes through the side. That gives me an indication of the conical shape of the head. So is it conical shape? And it's important because you don't want a pinched in muzzle like that, or you don't want a hard stop. You want something just slight, a very slight stop. Okay? And again, yeah, it's just too much. Too much to do so these are just three heads that I think represent a good, good accent head. And the lips tight, they're not pendulous. It must be tight fitting for all the, all the varieties. Remember, it's one breed standard which is described for all. So there's only a variation when it comes to coat of how it describes different coats, but it's essentially the same framework. Okay. Well-developed upper and lower jaw. This again, I'll let you read that. But why it's important for a Dachshund to have full dentition and good dentition? You saw what a badger looks like. So they must have good, strong teeth. Do not forgive missing teeth in a Dachshund. I, I don't personally count every tooth, but I generally can get an impression by looking at the, the bite if I know. 
Because again, if you have a crowded jaw, the under jaw is weak. If you have a very crowded, narrow, it's weak. So then it, it can't do its work, which is basically to, to take on badges. So this just goes through some mouse, correct mouse, and some incorrect. Okay? So do not be forgiving of bytes in Dexon. It must have a scissor bite. If it doesn't have a scissor bite, forget it. Level is not, we don't forgive, and definitely undershot, no way. Yes. They, they must have good strong teeth, not not little teeth. Even in, even in the miniatures and the canadians, they must have good nice sized teeth. Again, going back to function, um, is uh, bites a problem in the breed? You can get sometimes issues with certain lines of missing incisors. And so I tend, as a breeder, I tend to to be a bit harsh on dogs that do not have full dentition, because it's a breed that's meant to have full dentition. Uh, again, as I said, I'm not a, a tooth fairy, so I don't count every tooth and I'm judging, but I, it, for me it's important that they must have, at least the front. Somebody is uh, for me accepting that this level. Uh, but the art, because it was higher from some ducks of specialty, because I was judging ducks of the Devoraxel show, and then I gave very good ducks of the <coughs> Somebody said to me that there was a I, I would agree. I think what you did was right. Because as a breeder, this is where you are judging. You put your breeder's hat on. Would I accept a level bite? Would I use a dog with a level bite? I tell you what will happen. When you start becoming forgiving of the little things, then the problem gets worse. Because level bite this generation, then you might get a, a tight, a reverse scissor the next one, and then it just keeps getting worse. So personally, as a breeder, I don't accept. I, it must have a scissor bite, otherwise it's out. Yes, younger dogs, sometimes it, it might be uh, slightly overbite because the, the, the bottom jaw is the last to grow by the time they get the molars and things. So you can have a little gap, but as an adult dog, they must have a tight scissor bite. Compulsory. I, I mean, to me, it must have. The level bite. Everything's touching. Edge to edge. So everything is touching as opposed to overlap. Okay, eyes, medium sized oval, set well apart with clear energetic yet friendly expression. It is not piercing, it's not a staring. The color is bright, dark reddish brown to blackish brown in all coat colors. Now the English standard specific and says dark except in chocolate where they may be lighter. Because it's the color of the eye harmonizes with the color of the coat. If you imagine a chocolate with a very dark eye, the expression is wrong. It will be very harsh, it's a very harsh look. So other than that, they must have oval, oval eyes. A problem in the breed, especially with the miniature varieties, is the eye shape. Very round eyes. It is a common problem. And I don't know why it tends to be mainly in the miniatures and the connections that you get round eyes. And I'll, I've got another part of the presentation where I'll show you different types. And Rome, that dome skull like, a, like a, a chihuahua. They're supposed to be flat, as a flatness thing. Okay, and a wall or fish, okay, this is a dapple, in case you don't know, this is a dapple dachshund. So, wall, fish, or pearl eyes in dapple dogs is not desired, but it's tolerated. I, I breed dapples in, in mini, mini dogs, and I like to have brown eyes in my dapples. I tend not to tolerate these eyes, because again, when you keep breeding, the problems come on. So I'd rather than have nice dark eyes. If you look at the shape, this is like, to me, it's a good oval shape. It's a beautiful eyes. This is slightly rounded. My person is just bordering towards round, but still acceptable. Okay, ears. Set on high, not too far forward. Sufficiently long, but not exaggerated. It's rounded, not narrow, pointed or folded. And it's mobile, with a front edge lying close to the cheek. When you're examining a dog on the table, the ears are at rest. But when you call the expression of the dog when it's moved, the ears work. So that's where you have to see. See, this is a dog at rest. See the shape of the ears. This is an alert. 
the ears are slightly forward, not completely forward, but it's semi alert. This is aggress. This is again looking front on. And this is very important. You get the problem you get in the breed is low set ears, which start making it look like a gun dog, very low set ears, or sometimes too high where it sits on top of the skull. It's to the side, not the top. Neck. Sufficiently long and muscular. Tight fitting skin on throat. So no excess gear. The ear set, yes, on level the eyes. The length, okay. Um, I don't know, Claudia might, might agree or disagree with me. The length tends not to, some people, some judges, if they suspect the length is too short or too long, they will pull the ear to reach the tip of the nose. Okay, but it's not, it, it, it's, what's more important is to see the expression of how it looks. Because sometimes the length doesn't mean that it's right or, or, or wrong, it's a, it's a guide. You see a lot of people do it, but it's hard, to, there's no specific length of it. It shouldn't look too houndy where it's hanging like a basset. It should, when, when you look at it, this is what I explained to you about, when you look at it, your eye should tell you whether it looks right or not. But just go back. Your eye should tell you whether it looks correct, the length. There's no specific mention of the length in the end. Claudia, do you have any comments on that? <coughs> yes. The, the, the corner of the lip? Yes. So to the corner of the lip? Okay. <coughs> this one is a puppy. Okay, this was, a, it was one I, I imported. Um, and it's the puppy, so yeah, so they, they have to grow into it. They tend to have the larger ears as puppies, but as they grow on, they, the ears stays the same size, but the head grows. Yeah, yeah, but it's uh, the same if you measure food or ears. When it's a puppy, yes. the ears are real thin, then when they grow, yes. they are much shorter. So this, uh, you can't evaluate the length of the ears in a puppy. In this case, it seems to be longer, but it will be not. To me, it's a good length. I mean, looking at it, good length, and it will end up being a good. The, the the standard longs tend to have slightly larger ears because of the spaniel influence, in my opinion. They have slightly larger ears, but it doesn't mean that you can be too accepting of huge ears. The shape is more important, and the set or how it's carried that's more important. Okay, neck. My pet hate is Dachshunds without neck because the standard clearly says sufficiently long and muscular. So it's not a scrawny little neck, it has to have neck. It shouldn't be a head, what I call head stuck on shoulders. They must have a length of neck. It's important. And it goes back. So these are dogs that I find have sufficient neck. This is an English champion, a very famous English champion. Some may argue a little exaggerated. I think it's sort of balanced. Again here with neck. This is an American dog. Another American wire. An English dog. All of them have sufficient neck. This one? Yeah. Yes, as I said, it could be on the exaggerated side, okay. but I know what's happening on this picture. They've stacked the dog and they've stretched the dog out. And, and a lot of handlers, American handlers, tend to stretch the dogs out. And it's catching on around the world, they're stretching the dogs. Um, that's why I mentioned that some would argue this is bordering on slightly too long. Body, chest, sternum well developed and so prominent a slight depression appears either side, that's the prosternum. They must have a depression on either side of the prosternum. The rib cage seen from the front is oval. It is not round, it is oval shaped. Okay, I've got another diagram that you can show you. That's, that's oval. It's not round. And it's roomy, give plenty of space for heart and lung development. Back to function. When you're 20 feet underground, they have to have that. Why do they have the prominent chest? Because heart and lung room, so they can breathe. Oxygen levels at that level are minimal. So the dog is working. It's not just telling it's working. So it must have heart and lung, enough heart and lung room to be able to do that work without passing out or dying underground. So that's again why 
they need that heart and lung room. Ribs carried well back. Again, important for the rib cage. Correct length angulation of shoulder blade and upper arm. Front legs covers the lowest point of the sternal in profile. Body sufficiently clear of ground to allow free movement. This is the other thing about why. As I said, yes, they work underground, but they also have to run on the overground before they get there. Now, if they've got chest on the ground, short little legs, by the time they get there, they're already wasted energy. So they need to be able to move as well. Upper line blending harmoniously from neck with slight neck to slightly sloping croup. The withers are pronounced. The back behind the high withers, top line running from the thoracic vertebrae straight or slightly inclined to the rear. So I would say this is slightly inclined. This is also slightly inclined. You will see, um, you know, when they talk about Daxons, they say the three L's, long, low, level. Now level, people argue level meaning spirit level or level meaning that there's no break in the top line. I tend to think it's spirit level. But you do see a lot of dogs, a lot of Daxons that have slightly sloping top lines. Which is actually incorrect, but it's, it looks pleasing to the eye. So a lot of them win. That they have the high withers, but then it's a sloping top line. It should be level. Loin strongly muscled and sufficiently long. The croup broad and sufficiently long, slightly sloping. The underline and belly tuck up slightly. This is a bitch, so she's slightly, underline not very clear, but you can see the slight tuck up. It should not be a whippet tuck up, where from the rib cage it cuts right up, which you see in a lot of dogs, miniatures especially. It should harmoniously go but end up end up with a tuck up. They must have um, hang on, just, yeah okay we'll talk about it then. Four quarters, general uh, appearance, strongly muscled, well angulated, seen from front, clean front legs. Clean. We don't like wrinkling on the front legs. This is another thing that happens in the breed now. You see a lot of wrinkling. And in, 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 the, in the smooth varieties, it's a bit easier to see. You can see the wrinkling. I am not really forgiving. Again, it's, you assess it according to the entire dog, but wrinkling is not preferable. We want clean legs. Clean legs. This dog, this is wrinkling. This is, this is not a perfect, it shows you wrinkling on, on the front legs. Straight, good bone. They must have good bone. It cannot, it's not a weedy little dog. Again, go back to function, a badger. If it was a weedy, without bone, it must be a strong dog. It cannot do its work. So that's why, again, it must have. All right. I just, I'm just going to move on. You guys have read that? I'll just, I'll just move on because I want to, yeah, get to the diagrams. So here you have the oval front. This is too narrow. When I judge a Daxon, one of the first things I do after I examine the front, and after I've touched, to feel the shape of the, 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 the body, the front, is I actually put three fingers under the front, and I see if I can get three fingers. I've got big fingers. So if, you must be able to get, under for a standard smooth, I can get three fingers underneath. Again, it must have that space. Going back to function. If it was narrow like this, when it digs, the earth has got nowhere to move. So you're going back again to function. So they must have that space between the front legs. It is acceptable for the feet to slightly turn up, 10 to 2. I like them straight. But they, in the miniatures, they tend to turn out. But what you tend to find is that when they do turn out, the, they have slightly shorter upper arms, and that's why the feet are turning out to compensate. But many decks, and if you read any books, it says it's acceptable for them to be tended to. I personally like them straight. The, I think that the right way to see the trunk is up and down and stop without touch. You can see it. You can see it clearly. You send them out and back, and they come back, and you can see very clearly that because there's no adjusting by handlers. That's important to assess. Rib cage, nice long rib cages. You want to be ripped back. This dog, this is a, this is short rib cages are a problem in the breed. You get many dogs, and the rib cage ends just past the front feet. Past the front feet, the rib cage ends and tucks straight up. You want a nice long rib cage. 
when we look at puppies and we assess puppies, we always look at the length of rib on the puppies. I like to look at them wet when they're born, pick them up, and I can see the rib cage. And you want a long rib cage, it has to protect. Why do you need a long rib cage to protect the heart and lung function? If you have a short rib cage, the, the heart and lungs are exposed. So that's why the rib cage is important. And you also need a long rib cage to support this overall long dog. If it has a short rib cage, you're, you're going to have a longer loin, and there's a weakness in the back. So you want the rib cage because it holds the frame of the dog together. Yes. Yes. I mean, okay, these are the tricks. When you have, you have a dog that has slightly not good underline, you give it a nice big drink of milk or some food before you take it in the ring, and the underline appears so that you don't see that suck up the root cage. That is why it's important when you're examining to actually feel. When the purpose of putting my hands between the front legs is twofold. One is to see I've got weight, and the other is to feel how far back the rib cage goes. And so when you do that, put your hand underneath, you will feel how far the rib cage goes. So it's important when you're examining to feel the length of the rib cage. They are supposed to be well rib back. And then this, this diagram is just talking to you about angulation. Okay? <coughs> this is another problem in the breed, elbowing up. Not so much in the standard varieties, very common in the miniature varieties. Where the elbows are. So handlers on the table will stack the dog, they know how to tuck the, the, the elbows in. But it's on the move that you can see, you can't hide it. When they come back to you and they've got this front. Because of the construction of the dog being how it is, it is an issue with the breed. You do get elbows. And tight elbows are important, essential in this breed. So it's something again for people to check, but it, it's a problem that they have. Okay, I'll just quickly run through this about level top line good rib cage and then the slight tuck up tail coming off the we'll, we'll talk about the tail later but the tail coming off the back tail set is important I'll talk to you about that this is a sway back weak in um, rib cage and the tuck up and this is just the way for extremes here okay and knuckling over is another thing that you will see in the breed, that they knuckle over. And it's, it's basically a structural fault. The other thing that's important to look at the Daxon is actually when you're judging, is to look over the dog to see the shape. They must have a waist, okay? It's not supposed to be straight all the way. They must have a waist, it's important. And this also gives you an idea of how long the loin is and, and Feet. I've mentioned feet to you. This is good front feet, nice digging feet. And you see how the rear feet are smaller. Okay? A bit clearer on this one maybe. So the rear feet are smaller than the front, nice padded feet. You are nice good padded feet. And good feet, they must have arched toes. Flat feet is another issue in the breed. You get that look like this is terrible. Because again, function, it cannot dig with flat feet. It's not a swimming dog. It's supposed to be used for digging. High quarters. Ideal angulation. Just giving you an idea. They must have turn of stifle. You find many that do not have turn of stifle that are too straight in the rear. Extremely straight. Again, it goes back to function. They cannot clear. When you watch a Daxon moving, it's supposed to have reach and drive. If you have no turn of stifle, you will never get drive. You cannot drive the dog, sort of has a very short movement. So that's why it's important. And short hocks. We love short hocks in the breed. Breed specialists, when we see a dog with short hocks, we sort of go crazy. Because hocks is an issue that you battle with a lot. Most tend to have longer hocks, and it causes a weakness. So you want nice, strong, short hogs that can basically give you driving power. So, the second picture is that long. It long. is a long hog, correct. I ideally want it ending like that. But as I said, it's something, an issue that you have. 
this dog has got, I would say, nice short hops comparatively to the rest of it. Okay, but this is again to show you the rear feet being smaller and nice arched feet, again, not flat. Why is it because of the terrier influence maybe? The wires tend to have straighter rears. Okay, this just goes through. Now this is a bitch that I think has or the dog or a dog that has beautiful short hops. That's just like wow. Very short hops. Still has sufficient turn of cycle, but short hops. Now something that's not mentioned in the breed standard, but breeders we know it. We say a Dachshund must have an apple bum. What is an apple bum on a Dachshund? You imagine an apple, you cut it in half. You stick it on either side of the back of the dog. So when you look at the dog from behind, it must have that apple shape. Also from the side when you look, it must have that roundness. And the roundness will say that the angulation means the angulation is correct. Because if you don't have the correct angulation, no turn of cycle, you won't get a roundness. It will be very straight, triangular. But these are just things that you would look at. So that's why you used to stand behind the dog and also see what the shape is like. They need the muscle to give them the drive. If they have no muscle, they're slap sided in the back. They have, we, we call them, they have no arse basically. Then they have no power. Tail set. Set on, not too, sorry, not set on too high. Set on means this. Where is the tail set? as opposed to how it's carried. Tail set. Where is it set on on the tail? That is more important than the carriage of the tail. Because sometimes you get judges saying, oh, it was a nice dog, but you know, he's, he was carrying his tail too much. I can live with a dog carrying his tail as opposed if the set on of the tail is correct. What you don't want is the tail coming off the back like a terrier. That is more of a, of a fault. So you want a full group? Continuation, yes. Yeah. Sort of comes off, but gentle. But Not then most of the time, with the high tail comes a short group. Correct. Yeah. It goes hand in hand. Yeah. Any, any breed, you oh. have to get that. So tail set is important. This weekend, there was a couple of dogs that we saw on our watch that had very high set tails. So basically, uh, we call it that the tail stuck on as an afterthought. They forgot about the tail. Oh shit, we have no tail. Let's just put it here. They chuck it on the back. That's incorrect. So the tail, the set on of the tail is more important than the carriage of the tail. Obviously you don't want a gay tail, you don't want it, but if it's carried slightly out, the set is more important than, than actually the, uh, the carriage of it. Okay, gait and movement. Ground covering, rich and dry. Okay, you, you want to see, just like the shitters, you want to see clean pads as they are moving away from you. I mean, not in the same sh format of how a shih tzu moves away, it's got kick up, but you have to see the pads. You have to be able to see the pads. Because the dog drives from under and pushes up. It goes, starts here and propels itself out. Level top line. It has to maintain the top line of the move, which is important. Again, clever handlers can stack a dog with a poor top line to make it look like it's got a good top line. But that's... Here's just a couple of moving shots. like this in parallel but it's under the body in parallel so when you when you look at the movement it's supposed to be think of a train it's supposed to move straight like a dime it has to be true it's not curved in the front is not crossing over straight clean movement but as Claudio said under the body not narrow under the body but under the body sitting under the body from the elbow it wraps around the bit, yes right? so the wrap around which is the oval front we talked about which is unique to the accident the chest when it goes to the chest the, the chest is supposed to sit in that crook if you look at unfortunately we don't have a live example to show you the construction of the front leg of a dachshund it has a, a curve and the chest is meant to sit in that crook what we call the crook 
So when you're assessing also, the chest has to reach the crook. You will see those that have no chest, right? And that's wrong because the, the whole construction is supposed to sit in that crook. So, in other words, like many people, I just do explain, the example Jack Russell that here, when they move, the legs like this, they move. That. And when they move faster, they go, they go this way. But the accent is like this, just like what's working, just like that. Yes. Very, when you very see similar to the accent like this, the next one's completely wrong. It has to fold in. So there's a fold in the middle. For those of you who want to see a, a very good example of illustrated movement, if you go to the American Camouflage website, they have an animated moving the accent in slow motion so you can see at every point where the foot is supposed to go and how it's supposed to look side gate and front and out back. The, the Datsun is one of the most speed of the uh, Yes, and for this you need to, to reduce the base of the rectangle of the, of the body. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, uh, the gravity center center of gravity is yes, yes. very close to the ground. This 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 shows you what they mean about parallel. See the sequence? It's not dead straight, it's, it comes in slightly, but it's still correct, it's under the body. And same with the rear. Remember I told you about you have to see pads? It will show pads as they go in. Down. It's slightly exaggerated. Okay. Just some illustrations of moving the correct and faulty movement. Now this weekend, this is another thing that I noticed. The majority of the Daxons had very weak periods. They all moved like this. Because the musculation and the construction was wrong. So they had sometimes too much angulation, and so there was a weakness, and they moved like this. They basically wobble as they move, as opposed to being true. This is how they're supposed to look. I always say just train tracks. Just think of a train track. It's straight. There's no coming in or converging. And here you can see elbows out. Elbows out tend to mean the front legs are narrow when they move. Coat. I can run quickly on this. This is smooth hair. Now, there's also a misconception of this. Maybe Claudia might disagree or agree with me. Smooth doesn't mean smooth like a GSP or something like that. A smooth coat actually has coat that you can pick up. They actually have, because it's guard hairs, they have coat that you can actually pick up. I don't mean long coat, but it has to have coat that you can pick up. Unfortunately, a lot of American influence has ended up with very smooth coats. You can see this bitch has a bit of rough. You can see there's, there's coat that you can pick up. On this, it's slightly too smooth, but it's too smooth. And again, when they work and they go, it tears easily. If the skin is too thin and the coat is not there to protect it, it can tear very easily. But they are supposed to have some coat, which a lot of people think that, no, it's smooth until it's, you know, like a, yeah, really, even GSP is extremely smooth though. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the wire hair. They have furnishing. And the amount of furnishing, do not penalize the amount of furnishing on a dog. Because more important that it's a correct Daxon than how much of beard and how much of furnishings it has. Do you have any comment to make on that Claudio? Yeah. You tend to say very fluffy. There was one this weekend that looked like a dandy dimmon. It had very fluffy. Yeah, that was without. See, that's the wrong coat. It's too soft. The wire is supposed to have a, a close. When you look at a wire from afar, it's meant to look like a smooth, actually. The original is supposed to look like a smooth. It's not supposed to have all these great amounts of furnishing. The right wire, the Yes. This is a pin wire coat, and a lot of people mistake this as an incorrect wire coat. 
but this is actually the ideal wire coat that you want. It's the strongest. In fact, a lot of breeders try to put pin wire coats into their wire coats to get the harsh texture that Fadi was talking about. So if you ever see a dog like this and you think, oh, it looks like a smooth actually. It's not. It's a pin wire. And it's ideal. It's very little furnishing, but it has the correct harsh texture that you want on a, on a wire. And, and a lot of people chuck it out, but breeders, they, they pray to get pin wires because they put it in to, to improve their, their coats. Okay, so long hair. Um, feathering, tail, buttocks, and on the front, and here. Now the other reason why on the coated varieties you must touch and feel is to feel when you feel the prosternum. Many many longs don't have a prosternum, but the groomers groom it in to make it look like it's a prosternum. That's why you have to feel to see if it has the correct prosternum bone that you can feel, and then the chest. Colors: red. These are red in the three coats. Or brown, reddish brown. Ah, the controversial cream. <coughs> I have to mention this because now if I go back, it <coughs> says red, reddish yellow, yellow, all with or without interspersed black hairs. Okay, now it says yellow in the in the, in the uh, FCI standard. This is something I feel that they maybe should correct it and maybe say when disqualifies cream because. Creams are actually not a color that you award. It's become very popular in the UK and US, in Japan. The Japanese Kennel Club have just last month announced that they will no longer accept the cream color and breeding. Extremely popular in Japan. When I judged in Japan, I did a CASIP show and I called the show manager over who was actually a Datsun person and I said, look at all those dogs here. I've got 25, 30 creams. I'm judging a cassette show. I cannot award them. I said, do I send them out of the ring? He said, no. They've all paid about 100 US to enter. He said, can you just judge them but don't give them any high awards? I said, okay, fine. But the cream color, now some argue yellow. The standard says yellow, so they say, is this acceptable as yellow? No, it's a cream. Yeah. It's not desired. It's Correct. And then, Frank will go. So again, because of working, you don't want the color, the color that is not allowed. But it became very fashionable. In England, it's very popular. Um, creams of various colors. I don't know why. I personally don't like the creams. Um, it was never a color that appealed to me. I like the traditional colors. But when you judge, you have to be very careful never to give them a high award. Just like the French Bulldogs, the fawns without the black mask. Okay, and then we have the two colors, which is the chocolate and tan, with the tan points and the black and tan, again with the tan points and the markings. Now, another issue in miniatures is the tan points on the chest tend to be some of them huge. They're massive. I prefer them not to have such visible tan points, but to be smaller. But again, it's a minor point. But these exhibit the correct amount of tan points. And it must be a clear, rich tan not a smutty, not a interspersed, almost looking gray or black, which you can sometimes get. Okay. White is not desired, but single small spots do not disqualify. Ten or yellow markings, too widespread is undesirable. So that's what I was talking to you about. You see how much of, of the ten points there. It's practically, I, I say that I call them headlights. They look like headlights coming at you because it's so, so big. And this is far too much white. If this white, slightly smaller, possibly acceptable, but no. You don't want any white on the dog, as far as possible. This is a, this is a, 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 a chocolate bread to a red. So what we call a split red. So they have a red coat, but they have lighter eyes and a chocolate nose. See this one as well? Claudia, what's your, your personal opinion on, on split reds? I know in Europe it's acceptable. Um, but not much. Again, you pref you prefer the to put up. We prefer the, yeah. Um, in the UK, Australia, they'll never accept this color. 
because again, this goes back to the genetics of breeding uh, chocolates and grapes. But you can see them in Europe. This is actually a dog I exported to Russia. We did a lot of winning there. But when you breed them correctly, they can actually end up giving you the correct colors in the end. So it's not such an issue because it's the color. Dapples, basic color is always a dark color, black, red, or gray, and desired gray beige patches. This is a smooth, this is a long, this is a long puppy, silver dapple. And dapples, there's two. This is a silver dapple, and then you have a chocolate dapple. Okay. Disqualifying double dapples. Now the reason why double dapples are disqualified, this is when you breed two dapples. You cannot breed a dapple to a dapple. We always breed a dapple to a solid color. And the reason why you don't breed dap dap dapple to dapple is because you get dogs like this. And most of the time, they have health issues. So that is why it's never encouraged. They can be sometimes born missing their entire eyeball. They can end up with serious issues. So we never, never, never breed dapples to dapples. And if, if they ever turn up in your ring, you shouldn't accept them. They should be sent straight out. This is a brindle, tiger brindle. Now brindles can be from as dark as this, or this, to as light as this. But they must have the brindling lines through them. Okay, they're all acceptable. And then you've got the wire head colors, which is dominantly light to dark wild ball. But you also have red. I like this description color of dry leaves, so basically dry leaves, it's the red. But most wires you tend to get in the wild ball colors, what we call wild ball, the darker colors. This is also disqualifying, pie balls. This is when you have too much white and you allow white and you keep breeding white and you allow the white, it eventually spreads. In North America, they accept pie balls. So a pie ball can become a champion in the US, and many have. Some top breeders have bred them because they are a very attractive color to sell as pets because of the white. But we don't want them. The American Daxon Club for years, the members have battled to try to get them to disqualify this, but they haven't. But under FCI, pie balls are disqualified. Okay, this is just more pie balls. They look quite pretty, it's like people, yes. puppy farmers tend to breed these colors. Cute. Yeah, they're cute. Size and weight measurement. Um, any of the Daxon people here who were here this weekend saw Claudio measure the dogs and measure the chest. And this is a correct measurement where you with the right area. Some people try to do it and they measure it the wrong place. So it's knowing where to do it. It's basically just behind the front legs, across the top. So these are different measurements for a standard, a miniature, and a rabbit. Generally, you can get some that go over or under and then they get classified. I was judging in um, Romania, and I ended up giving group one and group two to what I, well, best in group and reserve in group to a condition and a miniature, and I found out that they were little brother and sister, but they were classified separately because of the, at a certain age, they classify them. So you can get, and they do it to breed. So, um, but generally your stewards will tell you what variety they are. This is actually interesting breed evolution. This is what the breed used to look like long time ago and how it's evolved so they were traditionally a lot leggier they had more leg um, and this is what we have today I just want to mention about the UK and the Euro type the earlier we talked about um, the FCI standard saying two-thirds and one-third UK is 75 25 marginal difference but it's still a difference you tend to find the UK and American dogs are heavier. The American standard allows for, for standards to actually be 10 pounds heavier. Their weight limit is 10 pounds heavier than ours. So it's a much bigger dog. And, and they're lower set. The FCI stand types have more length of leg. Okay. This is a very typical English type. This is actually a top winning dog. But you see it's practically on the ground. There's no leg. Okay, breed type. Before he enters the ring, the judge must have a clear conception of the breed characteristics of a particular animal he's judging. Three basic characteristics are commonly referred by the name of type. 
The unique breed features of a Dachshund, in my opinion, are the conical head, the long and low body, purpose-built front, that large prosternum, wide, heart and lung room, and the angulations. It is well angulated. It's not over angulated, but it's a well angulated dog. Okay, I'm just going to read this part. The four aspects, in my opinion, are Dachshund's unique features which separate distinctly from other breeds. Actually, I'm not going to read it. Yeah, you guys can read it. But these are the, are the things I'm looking for and I'm judging because to me these are the four things that make it unique from another breed. <coughs> these are the hallmarks. Um, as I said, men mentioned earlier, long, low and level. Long, the length of body, <coughs> the, the, the low, lowness to the ground, not meaning the chest, but the, the overall dog being a low, low type of dog and the level top line. Yeah, this again, how long and how long is long and how long? Of this, uh, of this man. Yes. What's this? How long? Uh, how long? So people say long, low, and level. So some people say, oh, long, low, and level. So as long as it can be a mile long, it's long. And it's low because it's, it's practically touching the ground. But no, the long means the length of the dog. The lowness means the lowness of the entire dog to the ground, not the chest, the bottom, but the entire dog and the level top line. These are three crucial things in a Dachshund. Okay, this is another thing for, because I did this presentation for the CKU judges. Judging dogs, look at them as silhouettes. It always helps. Any breed, not just Dachshunds, because you, when you, when you see them as black, you can see the outline. And then things stand out in your mind clearer. See, when you see a silhouette, you can spot things very easily. I go back. So silhouettes are important. That's how I, I find that it's very helpful to see them as black. Can I just have the other presentation, Joe? I just want to 